Milwaukee Police Department made the arrests. It's a difficult job. I make no excuses for it. But I've got a, a, a psychological contract with people that I am asking to take physical risks on the public's behalf. And that psychological contract is, if you make a mistake, I will treat you differently than if you did something willfully wrong. Good evening and welcome to this edition of Black Nouveau. I'm Joanne Williams. The Universal Circus was in town over the weekend. In case you missed it, we'll revisit our trip from the circus's previous engagement. Sudden cardiac arrest is one of the leading causes of death in the United States. We'll talk with Sean Robinson and Dr. Walter K. Clare about the health hazard. And we have four pairs of tickets to give away to the Milwaukee Rep's new review, Blues in the Night. But we begin this week with Milwaukee Police Chief Ed Flynn. We the people police the police. Numerous community members have called for Chief Flynn's resignation over the handling of Derek Williams' death. Chief Ed Flynn joins us now to discuss the Derek Williams incident and several other challenges that face his department. Welcome, Chief Flynn. Welcome to Black Nouveau. Thank you for having me. Thank you. The question that I want to ask you and that a lot of people want to know is the death of Derek Williams and the videotape that so many people have seen now of his death. Mm -hmm. When did you know about it and what did you know about it? Well, about a year ago last summer, the summer of 2011, I was advised that we'd had an in-custody death. Uh, you know, we'd had, it's a rare event. We've made over 200,000 arrests during my tenure. We've had four in custody deaths and three of them were drug related. This one uh, wasn't, and we didn't know what the story was. And so we had to you know, conduct an investigation, but the first step was an autopsy. The autopsy ruled that it was a natural death uh, caused by a pre-existing medical condition that was aggravated by the stress of the, uh, of the robbery, the foot pursuit, and the apprehension. Um, all right, we accepted that. And the next step was a criminal investigation by the district attorney's office to ascertain whether or not there'd been any overt police wrongdoing in this incident. Had they done something that caused his death? They reviewed the medical examiner's report. They conducted an independent investigation with their investigators. And they created a document which they forwarded to me saying that they found no evidence of police misconduct, that by all objective standards they could see, they'd adhered to policy and, uh, and, uh, and uh, the prisoner had died of, uh, of natural causes per the medical examiner. There was a subsequent investigation by the Fire and Police Commission that reviewed the facts as well, came to the same conclusion. When all those findings were forwarded to the police department, it was conveyed to us that there was no criminal jeopardy. We then commenced an internal investigation. Did they do anything to him? Um, and uh, had they violated any overt policies? There was no medical evidence that they'd done anything to him. Um, there were no clear policies that they had violated in their arrest of him and, and maintaining him in the back seat of the car. And so they came to a finding that there was no obvious uh, police wrongdoing. I didn't review the tape at this time because what I had presented to me was a man who had died of natural causes in our custody. I reviewed all the reports, you know, did what a chief would do, signed off on them, and we moved ahead. And it was probably months afterwards that... Uh, we received a change in the finding of the medical examiner. And uh, over the course of that time, just to step back a little bit, I mean, we'd always known there was a tape in the cruiser. That tape was reviewed by all the people that did the investigation. In fact, in the fall of 2011, that tape was shared with the family and with the family's attorney. So there was no mystery that the tape existed. It was just that it was evidentiary, so it could not be released until all the investigations were done. In May of this year, the newspaper um, reinstituted a freedom of information request for it. They'd asked for one while the investigation was going on, couldn't release it. They now asked for it again because the investigations were over. A series of letters ensued between the, between the newspaper and the city attorney's office over whether or not the family had signed a release to allow this to be put in the public eye. Because out of sensitivity to the families, we don't release tapes of people dying. Um, the family finally signed a release that was conveyed to us on September 14th and on September 17th, we released the tape, and the newspaper you know, posted it. And subsequently, well, there was a lot of shock and horror at seeing somebody struggling for a breath and complaining of medical distress and uh, the police apparently not doing anything. When it went from a supposed natural death, mm -hmm. which is the medical examiner's first determination, to a homicide, what was your first thought? Well, our system professional is going to think differently than the general public is. When a medical examiner rules homicide, he's not ruling murder. 
He's not ruling you know, misconduct. He's not ruling that someone committed a crime. He's ruling that there was a medical, there was a human intervention that facilitated the death. What he conveyed to us was the intervention was the foot pursuit, the arrest, and also the intubation of this individual, because after the officers did mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation in CPR, the fire department intubated him. It put something down his throat to facilitate getting oxygen into him. All of those things, in the medical examiner's opinion, were human interventions that were related to uh, his death. But you're saying that possibly when he was intubated by the EMTs, that may have been a contributor to his death. No, what I'm saying is that what the doctor noticed, and he noticed it in the first autopsy as, as well, it's important to clarify, and I don't want to sound like I'm minimizing anything, okay? Totally understand shock and horror seeing this videotape. Absolutely understand that. But from the medical piece of it, the first and second autopsies, the information contained in both is identical. In both autopsies, abrasions are noticed on his elbows and knees consistent with the pursuit and the arrest. In both autopsy reports, a fractured hyoid bone, which is a very small bone in the front of your neck. You can't die from it being broken, but it frequently indicates that something happened to you physical, and so if you were otherwise dead, it's an indication, well, something happened. Doctor didn't rule what, something happened. Um, the point is that at no time does the doctor make a finding that there was a criminal murder. Homicide with a small H in the context of this report, minimizing nothing means people laid hands on it, people put him in the back of the car, he died. The, the, the medical examiner never explains beyond that. The you, and you understand, I think you appreciate how shocking this video was for people to see it. Mm -hmm. Most people have never seen a person die, and thousands of people now got the opportunity to look at it on videotape. And you can probably understand why there's a hue and cry for something to be done, somebody to be accountable. Mm -hmm. And many people say, you're the one who should be accountable. In fact, in all the articles that I looked at, this one is one of the most interesting. It says, targeting Flynn. How do you feel when somebody says, you're the person who should be accountable? Well, it's not unexpected. You know, I'm in, I'm in charge of this organization. It's a complex organization that is charged with doing stressful, dangerous things under pressure. Some of those decisions are good decisions. Some of those decisions work out badly. Some of those decisions are overt bad decisions. My obligation to the community is to produce a professional policing service, which we have. Uh, my obligation to the community is to draw distinctions between errors in judgment, i.e. not diagnosing a critical medical condition, all right? I mean, these same officers have just been pursuing this man, struggling with this man, arresting this man, don't believe him for a period of seven minutes, and then spend 25 minutes giving him mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation and CPR. It's clear to us that they misjudge the fact that this hyperventilating suspect had, in fact, a rare deadly medical condition. You know, if you ever talk to an off-duty police officer and ask them, have you ever had a suspect hyperventilating in the back seat of your car after an arrest, everyone you will ask will say yes. Obviously, the horrifying thing is here, the man died. And so as you watch the tape, you're knowing you're watching somebody dying. And this requires of me that I draw a distinction between somebody who got it wrong and, for example, the strip search cases where somebody broke the law and we identified the pattern, we initiated the investigation, and the Milwaukee Police Department made the arrests. It's a difficult job, I make no excuses for it, but I've got a, a, a psychological contract with people that I am asking to take physical risks on the public's behalf. And that psychological contract is, if you make a mistake, I will treat you differently than if you did something willfully wrong. What contract do you have <clears throat> with the citizens in Milwaukee, however? The, they, uh, they, you want them to trust you. You mm -hmm. want them to use you as protectors and people who will follow up on crimes committed in their neighborhoods. But there are a lot of people now who don't trust you anymore and think you should leave. Well, they're entitled to their opinion. Great thing about a democracy, everybody can have an opinion and they can petition the government to the redress of their grievances. I'm at a stage in my career where the last thing I'm worried about is survival. The police chief that starts worrying about his job survival ceases to be an effective steward of the authority and money granted to him or her to protect the community. Here's what I know about policing in Milwaukee right now. We're a little bit like Congress. 
a lot of people don't like Congress and disapprove of Congress, and yet all the congressmen get reelected. Well, I have been to four community meetings this week on the north side of town, and in every one of those, they love their district commander, they love their beat man or woman, they love their community liaison officer, they like the bicycle patrols, and they feel like their neighborhoods are safer, and that's what they wanted to talk about. Now, I don't gainsay for a moment public concern about critical incidents that they perceive have been either mishandled or, or you know, by the police department. I totally understand that. But I also know that for four and a half years, we have absolutely focused this police department on neighborhood safety, and we've concentrated our efforts in those sections of the community where the disparity in victimization is horrifying. Well, let me ask you this. What's next? I understand you're going to create a criti critical incident review board. Mm -hmm. What is it going to do, and will that help people regain their trust in the Milwaukee Police Department? Well, we're doing three things. I mean, first of all, we're a learning organization. So, for example, back in 2010, when we had three fatal accidents related to police pursuits, even though the police had terminated the pursuit, the suspect went on and crashed into somebody, we re-examined our police pursuit policy. And I made the decision then that catching somebody in a stolen car wasn't going to produce a significant criminal justice sanction under any circumstances, but a dead citizen was unacceptable. So we totally revamped our, our pursuit policy, and police pursuits dropped by 75%, and injuries dropped by 65% in crashes related to pursuits. We learned from critical incidents that we hadn't mishandled, but there'd been a bad outcome. We changed the policy, and fewer people got injured. With the results of this medical condition in the back of the cruiser, we've changed the policy. It has been common for officers to sit in the front seat and say, I'm opening the window, breathe slowly, settle down, you'll be okay. And in most of the, the 200,000 arrests we've made, that's been good enough. It wasn't this time. And the cost of making that mistake is too great. Somebody's dead. So now we're saying to our officers, it doesn't matter what you think. If somebody is breathing heavily in the back of the car and they say they need medical intervention, just get it. I'm removing the discretion from you, making your life easier. Call the ambulance. That's part one. Part two, we've introduced curriculum now to say, hey, there's such a thing as sickle cell crisis triggered by physical stress. Let's learn about it and look for the symptoms. 200,000 arrests. We hadn't had a guy die like this before. We've got to know the symptoms. Now we know. We've got a picture of them. And that training is in the academy right now for our recruits and will be given to all of our in-service officers. And the third piece is a critical incident review board. And the purpose of that is to deconstruct every critical incident with a view towards, like in our pursuit policy and in our new medical policy, what did we get right, what did we get wrong, what do we institutionally have to do to prevent something going wrong again. Chief, thank you very much for coming and talking with us and explaining some of the steps that you've taken to make a difference with the Milwaukee Police Department and the citizens that you serve. We hope you'll come back on Black Nouveau and talk to us in future about other things the Milwaukee Police Department is doing because we welcome you coming on the show and talking to Milwaukee. Thank well, you very much. Well, thanks for having me. I'd very like, much like to come back because there's much to discuss. When I say Big Top, you say Circus Big Top. The Universe Soul Circus travels across the United States featuring spectacular African-American artists as well as other minorities. The idea of a black circus dates back to the late 19th century when Milwaukeean Ephraim Williams became the first African-American circus owner in the United States. He is often remembered as He Is Here by the Gilbert and Jones Troupe, which performs in Milwaukee's Great Circus Parade. The Universe Soul Circus began in 1994 and opened the doors for African American performers. But right now, I want you all to meet the entire cast of the Universe Soul. Andre McLean is the ringmaster for the Universe Soul Circus. He says that the founder and CEO, Cedric Walker, wanted to bring a different look into the circus. Cedric Walker, the CEO and the founder of the Universe Soul Circus, he started in 1994. And um, knowing that there are um, African American performers and acrobats and stuff like that, and going to see other shows and not seeing too many of them, that's what 
made him decide to um, start this. One of the many highlights of the circus is the clowns, and the most famous one is Onion Head. This is my heart, this is my passion, because when I heard about this, my mom had died in 94, I left New York and I came home to take care of my dad, who was 94 at the time. So I was taking care of him, and during the time I was at a cousin's house, and his daughter came from Atlanta, Georgia, and had this magazine with this female clown face on it, just a face. And I read the magazine, it was all about Universe Soul, and there I, I put in my mind, I must join this circus, I'm going to join this circus. I called them up, they told me to send in any type of clipping that I had. I did that, sent in videotape, I sent in new paper clipping, which only had one at the time. Universe Soul signed him on, and he is now their signature clown. He is known as the clown from the hood. When I came to Universe Soul Circus, they had two clowns from Wrangling Brothers, Clown College, two clowns from Cuba School of, of Circus, and a, one clown from a Minnesota Clown School. And uh, I was the only clown that never come from any type of curriculum. All my clown had come out of the streets of the Bronx and Harlem. So they started calling me the clown from the hood. And it's stuck now. Here it is 12, 13 years later, and I'm still the clown from the hood. He's not your average clown. Even though he makes people of all ages laugh, his emphasis is on youth and their education. One of the most important things you will ever have in life is education, to learn, to go to school. Even to be a clown, you must know the math. You must know how to read, to write. To educate yourself is the most important factor that will ever happen in your life. Now I'm going to tell you my poem. The name of my poem is Equipment. Listen closely and try your best to understand. Figure it out for yourself. Do not be sad. You were born with all that the greatest of men have had. Two arms, two hands, two legs, two eyes. And a brain to use if you would be wise. And that message translates into everything the Universe Soul Circus does. We try to reach to everybody. This year, the theme of our show is the world in one ring. So we've got performers from over 11 different countries. So not just African Americans, we're trying to reach out to all. We're trying to reach, reach, reach global. That's the goal. And, and just showing people, kids as well as adults, that you too can still make your dreams come true. You can do anything you want to do, as long as you try and work at it. Sudden cardiac arrest is a condition where the heart suddenly stops beating and blood stops flowing to the brain and other vital organs. It's one of the leading causes of death in the United States. It takes approximately a quarter of a million lives. I spoke earlier with Sean Robinson from Access Hollywood and Dr. Walter K. Clare from Vanderbilt University about SCA. Dr. Uh, Clare and Sean, uh, welcome very much to Black Nouveau. Glad you joined us. We're going to talk about Thank our you, hearts. Julian. We're going to talk about our hearts. Thank you. Yes, the engine that yes, keeps Julian. us going. Uh, Sean, first let me ask you, uh, since you're, you're a television star, you're an author, you're involved in a lot of different activities, but you also are very concerned about your heart and your family history. Uh, absolutely, and thank you, Joanne, uh, so much for having us on your show today. My mother's name is Joanne, so uh, I like you even more. <laughs> so, um, but speaking of my mom, we have a family history of heart disease. My mother's uh, father passed away of heart disease, and my grandmother had heart disease. Uh, just a month ago, I went to the funeral of my very good friend, Michael Clark Duncan, the actor from The Green Mile and he died of sudden cardiac arrest. Every year in the United States, over 350,000 people 
die of sudden cardiac arrest. Those numbers are just astounding. So I'm here today because of my own family history and friends that I have lost to say we need to get control of those statistics. We need to get control of our lives. We need to eat a healthier uh, diet, get exercise, reduce our stress, and make sure that we don't become another statistics, statistic because the numbers are absolutely incredible. Well, Dr. Claire, uh, the numbers are incredible, and it's sad to hear of all the people who die of, of uh, uh, sudden cardiac arrest, but what's the difference between that and a heart attack? How can you tell whether you're having one or the other? Well, there is a big difference. It's a, like the difference between an apple and an orange. Heart attack is a blockage of the arteries that supply blood to the heart. That supplies the nutrients. It keeps the heart pumping strongly. Sudden cardiac arrest is an arrhythmia problem. It's a chaotic rhythm of the heart, such that the heart doesn't functionally supply the blood that it needs to supply to the vital organs. So there's a big difference. People can have sudden cardiac arrest while they're in the process of having a heart attack, but there are many people who simply drop dead. They have a sudden cardiac arrest, they have no problems with the blockages in their hearts, and yet they have this fatal event. So it's very important that people distinguish between the two because one may not have warning symptoms of chest pain. And what are the symptoms of a sudden cardiac arrest? How do we know if we're having it? Well, sadly, the statistics are very bad. 95% of people, when they have sudden cardiac arrest, don't make it. So we only get to interview those 5% who do make it. So we don't have all the statistics, but what we find is that many of these people have no warning signs. On the other hand, there are people who do have warning signs. Fluttering of the heart, shortness of breath, they pass out periodically, things of that nature. Or their warning sign is actually a sign that comes from their family. Like in Sean's case, they have a family history of heart disease. So it's very important that people know their family history. And then finally, it's very important that they visit their physicians. And we would recommend that people consider visiting our website, arresttherisk.org, and they can get more information from our website. Who is more likely to suffer from this, men or women? Well, it turns out that often we think of men, but we're finding that those statistics don't always bear out in some, some subpopulations. So for instance, in many instances, a black woman may be more likely than a white male, depending on the age group, to suffer from sudden cardiac arrest. So women should be just as aware of as men. Women more often go to the doctor, but they should also encourage the significant men in their family to see the doctor too, correct? Sudden cardiac arrest prevention is a family affair. And, and Sean, in your family, did anyone know about this condition before they uh, had their uh, attack or their arrest? Well, well you know, uh, Joanne, with my grandmother who had heart disease, I remember her always carrying uh, the little pills around her neck. Was, was that nitro? That's it, the nitroglycerin. Yeah, I remember. And this was, you know, years and years ago. And I remember in church one time, my grandmother, you know, she was a, she was a church going woman. And I remember one time she even fell out in church. Um, but for, you know, fortunately I had my grandmother until she was, you know, 94 years old. Um, but we don't always connect the dots. We don't always say at that time when I was younger, I didn't say, okay, because grandma was sick, that meant I was at uh, a higher risk. And Dr. Claire, is it, is it true that you may know you're having a heart attack. You can't talk when you're having sudden cardiac arrest, right? Those are two different things. That's exactly right. Uh, many people, if they're having chest discomfort, they have a sense of impending doom that something's happening. But with sudden cardiac arrest, it is exactly that. It's sudden. It can happen anytime. It can happen to anyone. It can happen any place. And that's why it's so important that we really, really stressed, stress to people that they must seek medical attention. They must, if they have symptoms, mm -hmm. for instance, with Sean's grandmother, that passing out in church, that was more than a hallelujah moment. Okay. <laughs> she needed to be seen by someone. Right. All right. Well, um, and so sudden cardiac death is very swift. Well, thank you both very much for talking with us here on Black Nouveau. And for our viewers, if you want to know more, you go to the website, arresttherisk.org. It isn't easy to say, but it's something important to know about. <laughs> thank you both for talking with us. You said it beautifully. Us, right?
The blues as an art form comes center stage at the Milwaukee Rep's production of Blues in the Night. Here's a preview. Daddy, you sure know your stuff when you take me for a buggy ride. Woo! I like it when you got your habits on. You can shift your gears with so much pride. Get a funny feeling when you gaze into my eyes. You give me such a thrill, you make my thermometer rise. I am happy. It plays about um, basically just one big love story in which it chronicles the ups and downs of this one, three facets of the same woman and her trials with this one man uh, with the backdrop of really good blues music from the 20s, 30s, and 40s. I find that singing the blues is not at all different from singing gospel music. I grew up in the church and that same grit and gut that you need for uh, the music in the Pentecostal church is the same gut and grit you need for the blues. Don't you put on your brakes, cause I likes it too much. Feel the wheels are turning and smell that rubber burning when you take me for a buggy ride. Blues in the Night runs until December 23rd at the Milwaukee Rep's Stackner Theater. Would you like to see it? Well, we have four pairs of tickets to give away to viewers who can correctly answer this question. Who is considered the mother of the blues? If you know the answer, call us at 414-297-7556 or email us at tvviewer.org. Give us the answer to the question and your name, address, and phone number. Again, we need the correct answer, your name, your address, and your phone number in order for you to be eligible to win the tickets. If you've been a contest winner within the last year, you're not eligible to win this time. The contest closes at 6 p.m. Sunday, November 4th. That's our program for this week. For Black Nouveau, I'm Joanne Williams. Thanks for watching, and good night. <laughs>